Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. It is called The Democracy Dilemma. I'm Ravi Agrawal. I'm the editor in chief of Foreign Policy Magazine and also the host of FP Live, our weekly show and podcast. I have some great guests with me here today, so I'd like to just begin by introducing them. Once I'm done, I'm going to ask you all to give them a round of applause. So, starting from the furthest left, first up, I have Shadi Hamid. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He has an excellent new book out called The Problem of Democracy, very relevant to today's discussion. And he's going to be signing books right after this event. Um, to his right, Mike Abramowitz is the president of Freedom House. He's also spent 24 years as a reporter and editor at The Washington Post. And finally, Maria Ressa is the founder, CEO, and executive editor of Rappler in the Philippines. She's my former colleague at CNN from back in the day. Um, she's, of course, the winner of the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize for her work fighting for press freedom. Let's hear a round of applause. What an amazing uh, group we have here. So um, we have about 35 minutes of discussion time, and then I'm going to open things up to you here in the audience. So please have a think about questions you might want to put to our panelists. So our title uh, for this session is The Democracy Dilemma. And it got me wondering, what is the dilemma here? I've been thinking about that. And it seems to me that the dilemma is as follows. You know, in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, you all remember that moment, and Francis Fukuyama famously described that moment as the end of history. There was a real sense then that democracy had won. It had won this big, grand battle of ideas. There was no better form of government. A wave of countries around the world began to democratize. Democracy was cool. And then a very strange thing happened. Over the last 15 years or so, we realized that things weren't quite working out as we thought they would. So yes, many countries were nominally democracies. They were holding elections. But those elections weren't always free and fair. And the leaders that they were generating were also not always democratic. Sometimes they were more autocratic than democratic. What happened? In fact, over the last 15 odd years, we are now in the midst of what scholars pretty much unanimously agree is a democratic recession. Why? And I guess more importantly for today, what can we do about it? So that's what I'm going to try and focus on in our discussion today. Mike, I'm going to begin with you. You run Freedom House. You rate and rank countries on how democratic they are using a range of factors. So at a broad level, why do you think, on average, countries are becoming less democratic? It's a great question, and about a thousand books have been written about this subject. So, <laughs> uh, so Freedom House has for 50 years published Freedom in the World, which is our definitive guide to the state of political rights and civil liberties in the world. And why do I say that? Because one of the things I'd like to say is that Democracy is not just about having an election. It's also about what happens in between elections. It means having a free press. It means having a, uh, a rule of law. It's, it's treating minorities fairly. Uh, it's a whole range of things, and we capture that uh, in, in, freedom in, in freedom in the world. Uh, there's no question that over the last 17 years, according to Freedom of the World, there's been a democracy recession. Every year for the last 17 years, we rate more countries as declining in political rights and civil liberties that have an improvement. Now, interesting fact, the report that we just did in March shows that maybe there's some hope that that, 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 that gap between the improvers and the decliners is, is, is narrowing. Uh, but I think you have a couple factors going on. Uh, number one, China and Russia have become much more was repressive internally and also much more aggressive about trying to tamper with the democratic order. I also think uh, you've seen countries like Poland, India, uh, Hungary, the Philippines, uh, even the United States, where some of the adherence to those uh, yeah, liberal principles that we captured from has really been declining. And that's the thing that I think we're quite concerned about at Freedom House. Mm. Maria, 
Do you think part of the problem is the way we've thought about democracy over the last 40 odd years, that democracy is sort of this end goal that once you achieve it, you're done, rather than a process, rather than an ideal that constantly needs to be perfected? What's your sense? I don't think it's the way we think about democracy, but a, the, an easy answer, and for the guys last night, I did try to be positive. Unfortunately, I didn't quite make it. But, you know, <laughs> one word answer is what's shifted in the last 20 years, right? 17 years, you said, but primarily since 2014. It is technology. It is journalists have lost our gatekeeping powers. Tech has taken over, abdicated responsibility to the public sphere. What are the principles of democracy? This morning we heard that it is actually American democracy, kind of the bright shining light, the, the experiment where you've proven um, that it is possible to have all these different voices. Well, uh, all of a sudden, this, this country built on debate now is debating on platforms on technology that is spreading lies over facts and rewarding aggressive shouting. Like, you know, democracy is also about listening and finding compromises. Where we communicate today is, is actually both polarizing us and radicalizing us. Things that I used to track Al-Qaeda in Southeast Asia, Jama'a Islamiya is what it was known as, are now the things I see happening in politics. So this ex the, the push towards extremism on both sides is tech. So to me, it isn't that it isn't that we've done anything significantly different as human beings, that as governments, I feel sorry for governments trying to govern in an information ecosystem, which is upside down. It rewards lies over facts. It rewards lies over truth. It rewards shouting and bullying, fear, anger, and hate over rational discussion. If we were on social media, someone screaming a million times, on social media would drown us out because they would appeal to, they would hack your biology, our biology, right? That's the problem I, I see, I, only because I've lived it. We have the data to prove it in the Philippines, and what we have seen is any attack on America, starting with 9-11, these are the two biggest stories in my career. Any attack on America is tested in the Philippines, your former colony. I mean, you know, quick set summary of the Philippines, 300 years in a convent and 50 years in Hollywood, our colonial. We were 300 years under Spanish colonial rule and then 50 years under American. So what we've seen, both 9-11 and this kind of information warfare against you, both of these were tested in the Philippines. We were the guinea pigs, you were the target. Well. I'm going to come to you later in a bit about the solutions Philippines might have. I will be more positive Other today. than you, the solutions the Philippines might offer for the rest of the world. Um, but Shadi, um, Mike said entire books have been written about this issue, and you've written one. Um, just broadly, what is sort of the, the thesis of that book in terms of how you approach the problem of democracy? Why is it that we've gone from if you look at the last 50 years as you know, a spreadsheet or, or a chart, it's like a roller coaster. There was all this excitement, and then suddenly, over the last 15, 20 years, um, a downswing. What happened? Yeah, so I, I called my book The Problem of Democracy because I identify one thing in particular, which I think is the fundamental question facing us today, and it will probably be the fundamental question for decades, which is, what do we do when democracy produces bad outcomes? Mm. Because clearly that's happening. I mean, obviously right here at home, not to presume anyone's political leanings here, but if you're a Democrat, you probably consider Trump winning in 2016 to be a pretty bad outcome, and there is a legitimate chance he might win again in 2024. But it's not just an American story. I mean, it's a universal one. Uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, um, where if the stakes feel so existential, and I think that's leading a growing number of people to lose faith in the, in the democratic idea. What I argue in the book, though, is that it's not easy, but we have to come to terms with these bad outcomes. 
we can say that far right politicians aren't going to win. There's no way to exclude them from the political process. They are going to be there. And we have to find a way to accommodate that in the political, in the political arena. That means we can push back, but there's no, there is no panacea of getting to a point where the far right is gone or Donald Trump and his supporters are gone. In this country, we have 74 million Trump voters who are not going anywhere. We have to find a way to live with them. And in my own work, I draw a lot from my experiences in the Middle East during the Arab Spring, where there was a lot of euphoria, and then that was shattered pretty quickly, and we saw the decline of the Arab Spring. What happened there? In free and fair elections, groups like the Muslim Brotherhood won. Islamist parties that believe that Islamic law this should... In Egypt, for example. In Egypt, Tunisia, a number of other countries. Um, so that led a lot of secular folks in these countries to say, well, if Islamists keep on winning, well, is democracy good then? And that's frightening because the commitment to democracy is about accepting the results even if the other side doesn't win. So we might not like the Muslim Brotherhood or groups like it, but if they win in a free election, we can't just say, let's get the military in to stage a coup, which is what happened in Egypt in 2013. Mm. Mike, you know, I've often wondered if there's like a secret dictator's handbook that gets passed around. <laughs> um, I remember when I was in uh, India as a foreign correspondent in 2014, Modi had just come to power. And a lot of his um, officials, um, when they would speak to us, one of the things they were very interested in was Erdogan. Um, they were very curious about how Erdogan had transformed Turkey. Um, and they had designs on a similar um, transformation of India. And it occurs to me that over the last 15 odd years, many less democratic Democrats have looked at each other um, sometimes with envy and gone, hmm, I wish we could do that. What's your sense uh, from Freedom House? Well, there's no question that the autocrats study each other very carefully. That's been a theme of our reports. We actually did a report about this five or six years ago, uh, breaking down democracy. Uh, I would say that the first dictator that really was kind of the model was, was Putin. <laughs> I always, it, 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 in, in this kind of modern dictatorship that we're talking about, uh, in the 1990s, after uh, the Soviet Union had fallen apart and, you know, Russia was actually a partly free country. That's not perfect, but it was not a dictatorship. There was a lively uh, media, there was a lively civil society, uh, elections were sort of roughly free. You know, Putin takes over uh, in the new millennium and he, what's the first thing he does? He tries to take over the, uh, the media. And uh, you know his friends, the oligarchs, buy up all the media, the free press. Basically, goes away in Russia. He enacts foreign uh, registration laws that basically, you know, are aimed at crippling the ability of civil society, which is so crucial to a democracy, to be able to hold him to account. And the tactics of Putin are being studied and copied by all the people you mentioned: uh, Erdogan in Turkey, um, uh, uh, in Venezuela. Um, Maduro, uh, and even in sort of ostensibly democratic countries like Hungary, or uh, in particular, which does have elections that are free, but basically Orban over the last 10 years has made it very difficult to, uh, for any kind of opposition to take root within Hungary. And I think that Shadid makes an important point about democracy. I actually do believe that one of the problem things we've lost with in our country and just around the world is the idea that you can lose in a democracy. Uh, that sometimes happens, that your candidate doesn't win and you need to be able to accept that and be willing to fight for two to four years from now. The problem is these kind of people, these illiberal populists, you know, like Orban, like Modi, like Erdogan is a textbook example. The election in Turkey was sort of free, but it was definitely not fair. Mm. Erdogan put all the, the power of state resources into really only media coverage was favorable to him. Uh, you know, he made it very hard for people to oppose him. So I think that's the, the challenge we have, that making sure that democracy is not like a one-time thing like it was in Germany in 1933. Mm. 
Marie, I want to ask you a question about the role of the West. And I think your perspective, just living in the Philippines right now, um, will be very important here. It often strikes me, um, leaders around the world, when they want to dismiss criticism, um, mm -hmm. it's very easy for them to go, oh, it's the evil New York Times, or oh gosh, it's fake news CNN, or, you know, it's, they tend to dismiss Western media outlets, uh, think tanks, organizations such as Freedom House, um, which then leads one to wonder, you know, are they losing their effectiveness because they are in the West? Uh. Are they less able to criticize because now we are in the midst of this trend of all of these leaders we've been discussing just saying, nah, they're biased, they're in the West. I mean, the first, you know, Trump, so Duterte was Trump before Trump was Trump, right? right. So he, and so it's not even just Western media. This is part of the playbook. And the first part, you know, I, I became a journalist 37 years ago, more than 37 years ago, where the pendulum, people power in the Philippines, you know, we kicked out of Marcos, the family fled to Hawaii, uh, and, and the pendulum then, that triggered 88 in South, 87 in Korea, 88 Myanmar, you know, I went on 1998, in uh, Indonesia, the end of almost 32 years of Suharto. So the pendulum was swinging towards democracy. But what was happening then is very similar to what is happening now. When things got very hard, what citizens do is there's a nostalgia for a strong man past because, and I, I'll, I'll tackle this one before I tackle the media, mm -hmm. right, and how, how we are demonized. I'm both CIA and a communist. It's very strange in the Philippines, you know. That's the info ops against me. But look, part of the reason why this is rolling back is democracy is hard. A citizen is hard. The panel this morning talked about civics. You know, the, we, the Philippine Constitution is patterned after the United States. We have a Bill of Rights like the United States. And part of the problem is that there's, when things get hard, we hearken back, we look back to Marcos, we look back to Suharto. Erdogan's main promise is that he did give some things to people. But then you add this thing of fear, anger, like, what if I don't get it, right? What if I, what if that side, those immigrants, these are just fissures that are being pounded by information operations on the citizens who are ultimately voting. So the way you see the world is being impacted by the, the platform where you are getting your information. And the hard part is that, that our kids, m most 35 years and below, you're getting your news from social media. I'm sorry to go back to tech, but to answer your question, um, CPJ parallels Freedom House, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, RISJ, Reporters Without Borders, the attacks against journalists, attacks, killings, jailings, all of these increase as democracy decreases. It goes the same way. And that has been happening for the last 15 years. You say 17, we say 15. And part of that is because if you don't have those journalists who are foolish enough to stand up, I, I had a 26-year-old reporter who was standing below Duterte, asking him respectfully questions. He was towering over her, literally was bullying her to stop asking questions. She kept asking, and so they shut off her mic. They took her away from the mic, but she kept asking. If you don't have those journalists who will do that, will you? And that goes back to civil society again this morning. What is our civil society willing to do? Do we realize what we are about to lose? So it isn't that Duterte demonized CNN. I mean, he demonized me. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was, because I was, I was CNN Manila and CNN Jakarta. Uh, that is the whole, you know, if nationalism thing that is mm. Modi, Orban, um, Bolsonaro, Lula will be, sorry, I won't go into all the other things, but all of the things that are happening in our countries has happened in yours. Uh, and so part of our, when media is demonized, when you don't trust, because that's the end goal, right? 126 million Americans were targeted in 2016 in information warfare that has 
you know, that has just happened, and no one has really paid the price for that. Not the platforms that enabled it, and not Russia. You have the data for this. But that changes the way you think. All those people who went to Jan on January 6, they believed it, mm. you know? So this, our emotions, our fear, all of this changes the way we think, the way we act, the way we vote. And a lot of the pressure you're describing often comes from proxies, trolls online, the whole thing can be so murky. Um, India is a perfect example now, right? India, you I said? Mean, India. Well, yeah, I mean, so just over the weekend, for example, Modi, who has never had a press conference in India, not once, uh, in all of his time in power, he, as part of his um, uh, time uh, at the White House, uh, at his state visit over the weekend, um, they agreed to take a question each from a U.S. reporter and an Indian reporter. The U.S. reporter asked uh, the only tough question that was asked, um, which was about religious freedom in India. Um, her name, uh, well, her name is Sabrina Siddiqui. It's a Muslim name. Yeah. The trolls uh, online went crazy, just yep. saying she is a Pakistani agent, or you know, or worse. Um, and poor thing. I mean, she had to defend herself and tweet out images of herself wearing an Indian cricket jersey. But why should she? And, uh, you know, so the whole thing was, was awful. But, you know, this wasn't Modi doing it. This was, you know, proxies or what have you. Um, but on that note, Shadi, um, since I mentioned Biden, um, one of the sort of areas that he has focused on uh, in, in the last two and a half years is democracy and is, uh, you know, what he tries to frame as aligning democracies against autocracies in a way that can seem black and white. Um, uh, my own sense is that that can sometimes backfire. But, but do you think that that's effective is, is in highlighting which countries are democratic and autocratic? And to riff on my question to Maria, if it's coming from a Western country, does that sometimes backfire, or is there a better way to do it? Yeah, so I think it's important to highlight the distinctions. And I am skeptical that we can learn to coexist with totalitarian states like China. That's not to say we have to pursue conflict, but the system of government is so fundamentally different than ours, it raises fundamental questions of, can we actually find a way to work with them in the long run when you have one leader who determines all the major decisions and where dissent, even the most mild dissent, isn't allowed. It's something about the character of these regimes that we have to be concerned about. And it's also worth, I'm, I'm actually a bit more bullish on democracy. And just to kind of offer up an optimistic note, if we look you at- You and Ru Maria need to get drinks off. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, if we look at Russia and China, we've seen their foundational weaknesses and flaws over the past couple of years. Russia can't even fight a proper war. It's an absolute joke. China was self-sabotaging its own economy with zero COVID. And where we used to say that China would overtake the US in terms of gross GDP in this decade, now economists have to push that back. And if you look at the longer term, China's in really dire straits because of its declining fertility rate. Its population will go like this in the decades to come. And that means that China will have a lot of difficulty sustaining itself. And also when you have one leader who decides everything, when he just goes according to his whims, there's no stability, there's no way to know what's going to happen in five or six years. If you're a Chinese citizen now, you don't know what your country is going to look like. And for all of our faults as a democracy here in the US, I feel pretty secure that America can withstand the tests that are put to it. And I actually think 2020 is an example of a profound challenge with Donald Trump and election denialism, but America was resilient and we should actually take strength in that. There's a different way of looking at this instead of the kind of doomerist uh, view, if you will. But I also just wanna say, when we've used the word democracy a lot here, I think we also have to be a little bit more clear. What do we mean when we say mm. democracy? And I tend to be a bit more minimalistic. I don't want democracy to be this big, amazing thing where it sort of translates our dreams and it gives us all the things that we want. Democracy should be seen 
as something more straightforward. It's a way to alternate power through periodic elections that are meaningful. When we start attaching other things, which are great, like liberal principles, I get a little bit nervous. When we talk about the classical liberal tradition, great, but that's not the same thing as democracy. When we talk about this whole package of rights moving towards minority protections, gender equality, um, the pr prioritizing the individual over the collective, less of a role for religion in public life. Those may all be good things, but they're not exactly the same as democracy if we look at it as free and fair and meaningful elections where we share power with our adversaries. So I think it's important for us to at least to just be clear about what do we want from democracy? Is democracy a means towards other ends or is it an end or is it an end unto itself? Uh, I just have to push back a little bit. Don't those other things serve as pillars for democracy? So if you let those other things erode, such as freedom of the press, such as uh, um, freedom of religion, then don't you end up eroding democracy or even by your definition, just free and fair regular elections? Well, for, for, for elections to be free, fair, and meaningful, you do need to have some freedom of expression and speech. So I'm not talking so much about that. I'm talking more about the cultural and religious issues that are part of the culture war debate here and are increasingly part of the culture war debate in a number of other democracies where we talk... Um, so for example, um, does democracy require secularism? I don't think it does, and I don't think it should be seen that way. When we see religious groups doing well in elections, should we say that's anti-democratic? And one, one example here in the US is abortion. I think it should be up to um, individual American voters to decide now on the state level, on the local level, and to advocate for their positions. And then the great thing about democracy is then, uh, the results of democracy are there, and that's that we have to live with those outcomes, right? So I think that abortion, abortion and other culture war issues should not be seen as if there are abortion restrictions, that means that America is moving away from democracy. So it's on those cultural and religious issues mm -hmm. that I would maybe focus more of my attention on to not kind of conflate mm -hmm. them. Sure, I'll take that. Um, so. We have a little bit of time left, and I, I do want to push us towards, you know, while we can debate what democracy is, but at the very least, in as much as there's agreement that we are in a democratic recession, how do we reverse that? How do we fix that? Michael, I'll come to you first. Well, I think that there are, there's no silver bullet to this. I mean, I actually believe we're kind of in a generational struggle, and I would personally put three or four emphases. First of all, I totally agree with Maria on the primacy of protecting press freedom and protecting the information, you know, cleaning up the information environment. As a former journalist, I can tell you thing, the, the, it's just so much different than it was 25 years ago when I was a reporter at the Washington Post. And you look around the world, there's just huge I guess someone has called it, you know, deserts of news, where basically there's no independent, mm. accountable, there's no independent news that's holding the government accountable. By the way, that's in our own country too, in certain local media. So I think definitely uh, the, the press is, uh, a, a, should be a major focus. I think number two, I think supporting people on the ground who are struggling for freedom. That's part of what Freedom House does. But you look around the world, there's amazing work that's being done. Something that was very moving to me was in Sudan, where about f three or four years ago, I had worked on Sudan for a long time in terms of studying it. I never thought that there would be you know, a, an effort to overthrow the dictator, but there was. And these were, this came from people on the ground, mm. uh, doctors, teachers, and so this is happening in every country in the world, in Myanmar, in Ethiopia, in Belarus, in Russia. And so I think these people are looking to those outside the country to at least give them support, to give them, uh, and, and people in Iran today, they, they want to know that, that people in uh, the United States, in London, and world capitals are supporting their cause. I think the third area I would say is fighting corruption. 
I think that is, I think, the Achilles heel mm. for, uh, for dictators. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to me that uh, one of the things that the uh, groups in Russia have gotten great traction on over the last uh, couple of years is really exposing the great corruption <laughs> that lies at the heart of, uh, of, um, of, of Putin's regime. And so I think, and there's all sorts of efforts now in the United States and other countries to really put a focus on, uh, on, on fighting corruption. Those would be three areas that I would single out. You know, you, you mentioned President Biden, and I think President Biden has had good rhetoric on the issue of uh, democracy. I think the, I think though, if you look around the world at specific countries, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, less results from the human rights and democracy agenda yeah. than you like. The one exception being Ukraine, which I do think that the future of Ukraine and the administration is really fighting hard for that, mm. is, is in addition to a sovereignty issue, is a democracy story as well. Mm. And you could say that more broadly about Biden's foreign policy as well. Yes. Um, Maria, I have to put the same question to you. Um, you are at the vanguard of this fight. Uh, I think so many of us look to you for ideas and, and courage. Um, from where you sit, what are the things that you think are being put in place and still need to be put in place to buttress democracy? I just wrote down three. Excellent. Listen, while listening to my... I, I mean, love that. And, and the thing of what I f forgot to mention last night, faith, love, empathy, a journalist using the word love, this isn't what we do, right? Um, but part of it is the faith, love, empathy, art, all of the things that isn't, if our thinking fast part is the part that is being hacked to change our thinking slow part, how do we connect back to what that is? How do we remember the goodness of human nature? There is uh, Pope Francis, I, I am a wayward Catholic to be on the record, I mean, but Pope Francis called 30 Nobel laureates into the Vatican uh, like two weeks ago and came out with a document, a world movement for human fraternity. Of course, one of the first questions to ask is, isn't fraternity a sexist word? Um, <laughs> and, you know, but it's Pope Francis's word, so, you know, we take the pace of change where we can go. But the fact that I was sitting next to uh, the woman behind the Arab Spring, Tawakal Karman, and then she was sitting next to an Iranian woman who brought up LGBT. I, yes, I'm not, we're not supposed to say what we talked about, but here's the thing. Regardless of religion, regardless of culture, we actually have far more in common than we have differences, and that the toxic sludge that is pumping through our information ecosystem has made us forget that. So we have to remember that, right? And I do think faith, religion plays a role in this, because look at all of the cults that have formed. Look at the rise. Rising with the far right is also a rise of religion that takes a political bend, right? So you kind of have to, I mean, in the Philippines, we have a pastor of Duterte, Kiboloy, who has, he calls himself the son of God. He was given a television franchise taken away from the largest network, the one I used to manage. And um, he's wanted by the FBI for sex trafficking. I mean, the world is really crazy where I am. It's gonna get crazier coming to you. Um, so, so that's the first part. Please do not forget, because it's our left brain, left brain, right brain. Don't forget the goodness of human nature. The second part is go to the root cause because we can like play around in downstream as long as we can and we will never find the solution because the root cause is upstream. I, I, I became a journalist because information is power. Information leads to justice. If you have no facts, you cannot have rule of law. If you have no facts, you can't have integrity of elections. That's what's been broken down, so how do you deal with it? I think about it like a river, right? This is the information ecosystem. And a lot of the debate that we have is down here on speech, content moderation. Partly because you have a $70 million plus tech lobby that wants you to say misinformation instead of disinformation, which is about power and money, and wants you to, con to focus on content moderation. Go upstream, right? Where is that? What's upstream? Data privacy. 
the, the panel before us, own your own data. We've been cloned and they own your clones, our clones. Then go even further upstream to the factory of lies that is literally polluting the river. We can do this. You heard in the panel before us some of the solutions, both tactical and strategic, that needs to happen. So this is, there needs to be a whole of society approach. This is it, right? And, and here's, the, here's the hard part. No, here's the easy part. Your values haven't changed. We in the Philippines, I believe our values haven't changed. We were the f one of the first signers of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, regardless of sex, culture, race. We believe in this, so we just need to act on it. Can I just add one, one thing to the mix? Please. Before we, um, you know, so I agree with everything here. I just want to add maybe another way of looking at it, which is, um, and it's weird saying this on the stage. I mean, we're all elites here, or at least we are, the four of us, I suppose. But I think we also have to take some responsibility and say elites haven't done a great job. And some of the fault is ours. Um, whether it's you know mainstream outlets, the Democratic Party in the US, other left of center parties, we have to ask ourselves, why have a growing number of people across the globe moved to the right? Why are they angry? Why are they revolting against center left and center right, quote unquote, elites? It's because they're angry at what has happened. I mean, in, in our country, the Iraq war is an obvious example mishandling of the financial, uh, the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. I mean, there were, these are profound errors on the part of people who are supposed to be responsible for governing well and competently. So I would also like each and every one of us to say, well, these people aren't just bad, you know, bad right-wingers who are just getting the wrong information. They have grievances that at some basic level have to be addressed, and I think we need to do a better job of addressing them. Mm, point taken. Um, can I get a rough show of hands to see how many questions we might have? Um, excellent. Okay, in which case, I'm going to move to questions because I could keep going, but I don't want to be too greedy. Um, so we have uh, a gentleman there with a microphone, and why don't we go um, first to that side? And I see two hands, uh, two ladies with questions. If we can go um, both of them one by one, please. Yes, I think you're both pointing at each other. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take your, so name, your name first, please, and then. Yes, go for hello, it. Hello, hello. Yes. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for this. Um, my name is Jade Sands. My question is, do you think there will ever be a time where political power and financial power do not play an effect with our democracy? Um, what I mean by that is, when I think about um, how you guys are talking about what is being put out there on Facebook or Twitter, every click yep. counts for dollar signs for somebody else, right? So when we are voting, it seems like the, I'm just gonna say the 1% are the people who are in charge of this because of financial power. So when will we actually have a democracy where our voices matter, where we matter, and it's not financial power that matters? Thank you for that, great question. And then to your right, yes, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thank you so much, I'm Alexandra Sharp. My question is, I know you mentioned earlier uh, the cornerstone that free and fair elections have on democracy, and I was wondering, so many countries in the world that the international community defines as democracies don't have free and fair elections for everyone, just for some. So can we still call those countries democracies, or do we need to redefine what makes a democracy a democracy? All right, great question. Um, and then why don't I tack on one more question. Um, so behind, over there, there's another lady uh, in black. Yes, go for it. I'm colorblind. You could be wearing navy blue as well. Yeah. <laughs> it is black. It. Thank you. Hi, I'm Thank Hope Olinsack. I'm here from Atlanta, Georgia. And my question is around the definition of democracy and sort of uh, America's role as sort of the light on the hill in terms of democracy, but the lack of democratic values that we often have here and the problem structured intentionally into our democracy that underweight certain voices, particularly those of color coming from the founding of our country and the way those have carried over um, 
into you know even our elections here and the reflection we should have here on not necessarily wanting certain outcomes, but wanting to ensure every every person in this country has a has a has a vote that counts equally. But yet we have structures that aren't in place for that: the U.S. Senate, um, Supreme Court. So when we think about certain outcomes, um, those can sometimes be frustrated frustrating, given that much of the public doesn't agree with. Um, many of those, but we have certain structures built in. So when we think about democracy globally, the reflection of sort of democracy here in this country and the role that the U.S. has played in sort of setting a course for certain ideals that we ourselves don't quite live up to mm -hmm. and kind of how we grapple with that. All right, thank you for that. So um, I think we'll end up taking three tranches of questions, given how many people put their hands up. Um, and I'm going to put each tranche to one of you. Any volunteers for this first one? Maria, go for it. This one. So your first question, um, everything is about power and money. I mean, really bluntly, if you look at it, right? In the old days, news organizations had both power and money. Now we don't. So now I know what it feels. <laughs> Sorry, as a joke. Um, but why? How did, how did power and money work in, in a US democracy? Because you had checks and balances because you had transparency and because you had a citizenry that took that, that transparency and made the players accountable. And then you kept it consistent. All of that went off kilter. I would say the rest of uh, other democracies around the world did to the shining light on the hill. We did try to follow this, right? Now I see America walking to where the Philippines was. One of my first stories in 1986 when I walked into the Philippines was how you walk into a restaurant and there's a box that says, please deposit your firearms here, right? And now I, I can see you moving backwards into kind of where we were, right? But we used to kind of use this as a, as a benchmark to try to go towards getting in strong institutions. Strong institutions, the reason why you were able to last longer, Silicon Valley since didn't come home to roost until 2021, because your institutions were stronger. Those of us in the global south, our institutions in the Philippines, we cracked in six months. Duterte was the most powerful president we have ever had. Uh, free and fair elections, um, I, I would posit that it is very hard to have free and fair elections in almost every country around the world, including yours, if your information ecosystem is about behavior modification when power and money can use it to insidiously manipulate issues like immigration, like race, why identity politics all of a sudden has risen up. All of these issues have been there forever, but now they pitted us against each other, and that is by design. Um, to go back to 2016, the Russian military doctrine includes information warfare. And to quote Yuri Andropov, who was a former KGB chairman, uh, he, had, he led the former Soviet Union at one point. He said, disinformatia is like cocaine. You take it once or twice, you're okay. But if you take it all the time, you're a changed person. Every one of us is a changed person because we've been living like we're on cocaine. And then finally, the la last question in this is America's role. We've never had perfection. No news group has ever been perfect. But we move towards progress, right? It used to be that naming and shaming worked. It can't work in an exponential information ecosystem anymore. And that's the reason why accountability doesn't work anymore. But it doesn't help when you're electing. All of us all around the world are electing illiberal leaders democratically. We know where we're headed. OK, so last, I know you. you Mike wants so we have to do something about it. Jump in, Mike. Well, I just wanted to pick up on what Maria said about the US. Uh, I think one thing in thinking about democracy that we make a mistake sometimes is thinking that it's like a binary thing. Either you have it or you don't. Yeah. I mean, to me, democracy is like a struggle. And you look at the history of our country, we had these amazing founding documents which espouse incredible ideals. And the story of American history in some ways is an effort to live up to those ideals. We had, you know, with slavery, with Jim Crow, we fell way short. You know, in our foreign policy with Vietnam, with uh, Iraq, which I still think is playing a role in the whole democracy debate. Yeah. You know, we, we've made very major mistakes. But what's really striking to me and which gives me hope about 
America is a resiliency. I mean, think about, uh, Sh Shamid was talking about the 2020 election. You know, the system held, you know, 70 or some uh, judges, you know, throughout the false claims. You know, there's been an incredible uh, uh, kind of flowering of, of civil society groups who are, you know, complaining about elections, complaining about civil rights, you know, pushing the government to do better. That's not happening in a lot of other countries. We need to kind of get that going uh, in other countries. So I feel generally hopeful. When Freedom House started looking at freedom in the world in 1973, only 44 countries uh, were considered democracies. Today. 90. So for, all the, for, for whatever the reasons, we're still going in a good direction, but we just have to, you know, just redouble our efforts. We can't take it for granted. Mm. Okay, let's take another tranche of questions. Um, this might have to be our last tranche of questions because we're almost out of time. Okay, so many people. Let's go to the front here. I see two ladies here on the tables in front. We'll take both of your questions. I'll see how they go, and then I'll try and incorporate a few others as well. Go for it. And let's try and keep the questions short, please, and ending with a question mark. Understood. <laughs> Hello, my name is Claire Atkin. I'm the founder of, co-founder of Check My Ads, the ad tech watchdog. We work with corporations trying to stop funding disinformation with ad revenue online. And my question is for you, uh, who said that it's bad for business, bad for Russia, bad for China to be authoritarian. And I wanted to ask you, how is it for corporations to do business in authoritarian governments or under authoritarian leadership? Is it in their best interest to have democracy? All right. Shadi, sit on that one for a little bit, and let's have the mic weave its way over here to the front. There you go. Yes, your name, please. Thank you. Is it on? It is. Diana Lady Dugan, uh, CSIS and Cyber Century Forum. Uh, I guess one of the things that seems to start fading in our litany of America is the term republic. And I think we need to revive it, not just revise it, because there's a lot of things as why should small states have so much power? And why does the small guy get as big a vote as the big guy? And we talk about all the people who are disenfranchised, and yet the word republic is just almost missing now. So I would like to see your comments and how the, we're one of the few republics, not just democracies, and how that term uh, fits into the future litany. Mm, that's a great point. So Shadi, why don't you take the first one, and Mike, maybe I come to you with the, the, the republic question. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to corporations, they're always tempted to do business in authoritarian states because there are markets and large populations. So China obviously is an attractive um, you know, place to invest and to think there could be a future there. But as corporations are realizing that what China has started to do, they kind of take advantage of Western intellectual capital and intellectual property. They benefit from that and, and repurpose some of these things for their own firms. And then they start putting pressure on Western firms, making it more and more difficult for them to actually do business in China. And then there's also the question of rule of law. In these countries, there isn't rule of law. There are the whims of the dictator. And if you're a corporation, you want some kind of regularity, some kind of predictability. But authoritarian regimes are inherently arbitrary. So again, I think corporations are realizing that there are risks, but then there's the short versus the long term. Because what I'm saying right now might make sense in the long term. Corporations shouldn't kind of put their eggs in the authoritarian basket, so to speak. But in the short term, it's just so attractive to have a market of over a billion people in a place like China. So you find that these corporations are torn in these different directions. And I think maybe one thing that can, one thing that we can have going forward is naming and shaming when it comes to corporations that do business with these atrocious regimes, one of them in China, which is committing a genocide against a Muslim majority, sorry, Muslim minority. And, um, and I think that there's a lot we can do to say there should be limits here and we shouldn't as, as consumers ourselves be okay with this in the corporations that we buy products from. We have 30 seconds left. Mike, um, maybe just one final optimistic thought for us. Well, I am optimistic and bullish about the future democracy. One of the things that you've noticed over the last 
uh, six years when I've been the president of Freedom House, we do not have a demand problem. Think about three million people going out into the streets of Hong Kong demanding that China respect their rights. Think about the uh, hundreds of thousands of people who protested in Belarus, a fraudulent election. Think about people going to the streets in Sudan. I think we have a, de we have a, we have a robust demand for democracy. Now we have to supply it. What a lovely note to end on. I want to thank all of you in the audience uh, for being fantastic, uh, asking terrific questions, and being as engaged as you are. And finally, a round of applause for our terrific guests, Shadi Hamid, Mike Abramowitz, Maria Ressa. Thank you very much.